So the next step was, all right, we, we defined it, we figured out what we wanted, and now it was really to turn it into web design, to work with Carol and the committee to uh, evolve the design, but also make sure our costs were where they needed to be. Um, we put the package together, presented to the board, uh, the board gave the go-ahead to move forward, and the committee then continued to work very carefully and closely with Carol and her team um, to get this building in place. So Carol, basically our team started in earnest on, on January 1st of 2017. So that's amazing because the pace that this happened uh, to me when I think back. And she has a great team of her own architects and her firm, structural engineers, mechanical engineers. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the landscape. Richard Loeffler, the landscape architect, has done an amazing job. I mean, it's one thing to look at on paper in two dimensions, but when it comes to life, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so the committee, you know, focused on a few things, and it led to some disagreements at times, but we worked it out. Um, honoring the architecture of Stevenson Taylor Hall. I always say that you could never compete with Stevenson Taylor Hall. If you look at it, the details are just incredible, and you could never try to, nor should you try to. So we wanted to honor and respect it. Um, we wanted to honor and respect the campus layout. At the same time, we wanted to promote an image of state of the art, of energy efficiency. Um, to focus on the student experience. These are the kind of things that guided our decision making. Um, with our basic concept design in place, it was time to find some builders. We went out and interviewed and got quotes from a few builders, ultimately choosing DHI. So uh, what I want to follow up on here is just some things that I think about when I went, we went through the building. You know, I, I try to line up what we do in our education at Webb versus what we put in the building. So, Webb is committed to the single class cohort, that 28, now 28 students, the board has decided that's the max will take in any one class, 28 students, each class, and giving them uh, an experience where they work and learn together. And that fed into the continuation of the idea of that four classroom design studio model, just better. Uh, collaborative learning, big part of the Webb experience, why we call ourselves a family, um, why we have great relationships to this day with our classmates. The design studios, the rooms that will be the students where they live and breathe. The team rooms where small groups of students can get together to do their things. A large, look at larger conference rooms where students or students and faculty can work together, whether it be uh, academic work, whether it be student government work, whatever the case might be. Uh, Hands-on learning, a big part of web it continues to be, but hands-on learning's changing. It's one thing, yes, we take up our diesel engines, and yes, we learn how to weld, and we learn how to work a lathe, but nowadays it's also control systems, and robotics, and AI, and all types of things. So we've added the innovation lab and makerspace. Uh, technology is, is not going away, it's growing faster and faster, so a better, larger, uh, more comfortable computer lab for the students and faculty. Uh, engaged faculty, you know, one of the beauties I say, we just had open house here a week ago, and I tell the story of Webb, and I try to impress upon them how accessible the faculty is. I've been taking my son around for college tours, and then we had a very positive tour guide at a high name school, and he was so proud to say, you know, the teachers are great and they're so accessible. They're required to have office hours two hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at my wife, and she's like, shh. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have this, the faculty in the building with the students, right below them, in fact. And that's, that's not an accident, that's important, right? The students come first, the faculty in the basement. <laughs> the research lab, say again? It's got a view. It's got a view. Right. The research lab, the conference room, again, all there to support faculty working for students. Okay? Web history. Web history is, a, uh, is very important to us, that legacy that we have. So we have the gallery, which is the tunnel, which will have uh, changing exhibits looking at uh, web use from the past and great accomplishments that Webbies have done and other historical nature of web. The cornerstones from the old building in the Bronx have found a new home within the structure of our building. Uh, we're honoring who we are. And then the Webb family, right? We are a family, so we have a lounge now. So we, before we had classrooms that were separated vertically and horizontally. We've reduced it to now horizontally, but we've importantly put a lounge, and more importantly, the coffee bar between them. So they will come together, they will come together. 
We have green rooms, a place for students to find a little quiet time, a little peace, and of course, more and more coffee. Um, so with that, I'd like to bring Carol Ventel, the architect, up to say a little few words about her thoughts about the building that she and her, her colleagues have designed for us. Carol? Our building shapes us. Only to conclude that the making of the Couch Academic Center came from within, from the culture of the place, of the students, faculty, administrators, the board, and staff, and even some of the beloved pets. <laughs> However, this new structure is more than a mere building. It is a campus reform. It is now truly a web campus from edge to edge, and one that we hope William Webb would be proud of. The transformation of an underutilized part of the campus, while retaining the spirit of its original design, has allowed you to reinvent the entire environment and reposition your message. Through this endeavor, you have demonstrated that you care about education most of all. This is the Couch Academic Center, after all. You care about the history of your context, you care about sustainability, and you care about the future. As architects, we had a prototype in Stevenson Taylor Hall. Four classrooms, 25 by 50 feet, in which 20 to 28 students did their design work on large tables, as well as studied in a lecture format, sitting in tablet-armed desks, viewing a projection screen at the corner of the room. Now, I've squeezed myself into that space to teach at, at times. Um, in these classroom spaces, the students looked out upon one of the most beautiful walled lawns in the country since they arrived in 1947, for 72 years. That prototype has been improved upon in this new Couch Academic Center, as if the old classrooms have been flipped to the back side of the building and stretched out to be the proper size to accommodate the educational needs for these extraordinary students today an increase of 36 linear feet, or 940 square feet per class. The view is not bad either. <laughs> Designing vessels for the water while having a view of Long Island Sound was absolutely intentional. As was demonstrating that the school was sensitive to the beauty of the Pratt Mansion designed by Brighton Bacon in 1912, now called Stevenson Taylor Hall by placing the building literally underground with a green roof that continues the tradition of the parterres or green terraces that face Long Island Sound. My favorite day was when the sod was installed and everybody exclaimed, the building just disappeared. <laughs> and that was the idea. Being sensitive to the historic context while also creating a highly sustainable and green building speaks of a belief in the future and a decision by Webb to do the right thing. We strove for the new building design to have enduring characteristics and to be stitched into your existing context. Yes, it is new, but we believe that the new merges nicely with the old. The brick pattern and coining, thank you, Jen Waters, is identical to Stevens Taylor Hall, and the arcade follows the profile of the collegiate Gothic doors that come from the dining hall and the reading room. Joe Cuneo's wish to see professors with a student under the cover of an arcade is a reality. Other members of the design committee team, John Couch, John LeBurge, Bruce Rosenblatt, Matt Werner, John Bronte, Rick Royce, and of course, President Michelle, worked weekly to make this project into a building that belonged on this campus. Dean Werner knows we strove to make this also a state-of-the-art building, while also adding a tunnel so that students could still arrive to his class without shoes. Yes. <laughs> Dean Werner, this practice will not end. John, 
John Couch always listened carefully to the many decisions we had to make and eloquently gave his opinion. It was this mighty team helmed by the desire of President Keith Michelle to do what William Webb would have wanted, to bring this great institution into the next decades and to educate students for generations to come. Personally, and on behalf of our firm, Bentel and Bentel, my partners Paul and Peter Bentel, and project architect Tom O'Connor, I must note that the opportunity to be the architects for the Couch Academic Center is one of the greatest honors we can imagine. I taught architectural history at Webb for six years and learned about the extraordinary students and the unique culture of Webb Institute. To go from being the architectural history professor to a practicing architect in the same context to now be educating through an actual building is a once in a lifetime experience. We are very grateful. We did not do this design alone. We have our colleagues and our team to thank AMA engineers, Dean Kasubis and Alonso Associates, R&W Engineering, and Richard Loeffler, our beloved landscape architect who was with us from the start, making sure the view line across the landscape was maintained. We also thank Richard Suma and the Glencoe Building Department, Andrew Messenger, your consultant, and the contractors from DHI, Howie Bennett, and Drew, now my best friends, and their subcontractors. We want to thank Webb Institute, John Couch and his family, and the other generous donors, President Michelle and the Webb Board, for giving us the opportunity to build a building in such a notable place and for such a remarkable community. I will end with a quote, some a tribute to Aristotle. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. As a collaborative group, we went beyond merely solving the functional and pragmat pragmatic requirements of Webb Institute but together reinvented and transformed a campus with a new state-of-the-art green building that captures the less tangible, yet most important, aspirations and spirit of your amazing institution. Thank you.
invite the, the, some of the individuals responsible for naming of the spaces to come up and just say a few words about what, why they chose to, to name the space they did and make the donation that they, they made. So I'm just going to go real fast, quickly through an arrangement of the building to kind of give you a sense of where these spaces are, and then we'll go one, one by one through the different spaces. So on the, the first parterre, should I call it? I say terrace, and she says parterre. Uh, the first terrace, parterre, um, we have Peggy's garden in honor of Peggy Michelle. Um, and then as we move out to the new extension, if you will, of that parterre, we have the Pierce McAuliffe um, patio, which is made possible by Joe Cuneo here today with us. We have the LaBerge Terrace um, on what is the kind of the northeast side of the building. And then on the opposite side, we have the Ron and June Kiss uh, Terrace. Moving down to the main or upper level, we're still working out what we're calling the floors. I don't know if we decided to keep. I hire some naval architects that has to be A level and B level to be our first deck. So. <laughs> I'm going to stay at it. But um, we have the William H. Webb Gallery, uh, made possible by the class of 19. I can't believe that. 54, thank you. Uh, all right, and then we have the Squatters Gulch, which they'll have to, they will be explaining later on today what they're all about. That's the class of 1979. We have uh, two conference rooms on that level uh, in, off the lounge. And one is from the class of 1970, one's from the class of 1973. We have the Ruby Lounge, uh, made possible by the Shorts family and friends. We have the Boise, Boise Bollinger Courtyard and the Alfred uh, and Joyce Zane Academic Wing as well. Moving down one more level, uh, this is a space that houses the faculty as well as some of the more uh, the computer and innovation spaces. We have the faculty in the faculty wing, we have the Jack B. Hadler Faculty Conference Room, which was uh, um, named uh, on behalf of Jack Hadler by Joe Masrick, a longtime lab tech at Webb and honorary alumnus. Uh, the Dean's Office, made possible by the class of 1993. We have a research faculty research lab, um, class of 1966. Um, we have the uh, one, two team rooms, little rooms for groups to meet uh, in small numbers to work on projects together. One is uh, from the Stone family, and the other is the class of 19. Oh, yeah. 69, thank you. And uh, last but not least, we have two, we have the uh, Richard B. Couch Computer Lab and then the Couch Innovation Lab and Maker Space. So what I will do now is I will invite, I will put up a picture of the plaque of the space. So as you go down through the building, you'll see these plaques. And I'm going to invite the, the donor to uh, come up and say a few words about it. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Joe Cunio and the Pierre J. McCall patio. Joe? <coughs> When you get to be my age, history gets more and more important because you're going to be part of it sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I thought about uh, a naming opportunity, one of the things that, that uh, just became apparent to me was that uh, we had one trustee that really a lot of us didn't know anything about. We didn't know about a lot of other ones that have uh, preceded us in time, but Pierce J. McAuliffe is probably the one single per single most important person in why each and every one of us who graduated from here <coughs> received a Bachelor of Science degree. Uh, Pierce McCullough became a trustee in 1919. He graduated from the school in 1905. And uh, he started an effort in 1921 uh, to enable Webb, at that time, Webb's Academy and Home for Shipbuilders to enable Webb to, to grant uh, Bachelor of Science degrees, because at that stage of its life, it was viewed in many respects more as a, as a trade school than as an actual college, notwithstanding the course material was the college level. He didn't give up on that process, and it wasn't an easy process. It took him 12 years uh, to finally uh, have it happen, and the first class graduating with Bachelor of Science degrees was the class of 1933, uh, and uh, the uh, graduation speaker in the year 1932 was a, a, a Democratic, former Democratic presidential candidate, Al Smith. He had been governor of the state of New York, and he had a reputation for enjoying a drink. Uh, at that time, uh, Lewis Nixon was, was chairman of Webb's uh, Board of Trustees, or he's actually called president in those days. Anyway, he was able to get Al Smith as a graduation speaker in 1932, 
the big challenge was keeping him sober so that he could be able to make a coherent uh, talk at graduate, which he apparently did. They sequestered him in a room and, <laughs> and, and they, they gave him lunch, but, but they made sure they moderated his, his liquor intake. So, and, and then it was as a result, largely of that final effort pushing uh, the effort along that, that uh, Webb was uh, uh, given the ability to, to provide uh, uh, Bachelor of Science degrees. The things that were most uh, considered at that time were that the school needed to have more liberal arts programs, or stronger liberal arts programs, that the library had to be expanded, that the uh, chemistry and physics labs had to be uh, improved, and that the school could no longer have a retirement home for retired shipbuilders. Uh, the school had been renamed in 1920 uh, to Webb Institute of Naval Architecture. Uh, and it so happens that in, in the same year that Webb first granted degrees, 1933, uh, Webb also dropped the requirement, which had existed until that time, that one had to prove need, financial need, in order to be eligible to come to Webb. Whether the two are related or not, we haven't been able to find out. Matt has looked, at, looked for it, I've looked for it, but we haven't been able to tie the two together. All we know is that they happened in the same year. But anyway, I thought it was really important that uh, Pierce J. McAuliffe somehow be recognized on campus for what he did that we have all benefited from. So when the time came to be able to create a naming opportunity, I thought it was appropriate that that patio have his name on it. He was a trustee from 1919 to 1957, which is the year that I graduated from Webb. I'm not sure that I ever met him, and I'm not sure that the fact that he saw what had happened, people like myself had gone through the web, caused them to think it was time to give up and go home. <laughs> but anyway, in any event, that was my thinking, and, and I'm just absolutely delighted that, that uh, he was uh, now has permanent recognition on the campus. Hallway. There are some seats down in front if you'd like to come down and sit. You're welcome to join us, so don't feel you have to sit in the back. Um, so we're going to move on to a couple of spaces now. Um, we have the Richard B. Couch uh, Computer Lab. We currently have a Richard B. Couch Computer Lab on campus, hidden, squirreled away beneath the faculty wing, and, and now we're giving it the appropriate home that it deserves. Um, we also, as was mentioned in one of my earlier slides, have the Couch Innovation Lab and Makerspace, an entirely new concept for web and something we're very much looking forward to getting started. So with that, I'd like to invite John Couch up to say a few words. John? Um, I didn't uh, really know what the words totally awesome meant <laughs> until just today yesterday when I first arrived on campus to see the building, I thought awesome was pretty good by itself. <coughs> now I know why the kids use that expression. So um, It clearly is totally awesome. Um, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the future, about technology and about innovation. Um, the computer lab, the innovation lab, and the maker space are probably some of the most important facilities we have here on campus for the future of the web. Um, and remember, I think it was Yogi Berra who reminded us that the future is not what it used to be. <laughs> uh, and, and we all know that we can't talk about business today, any business, maritime or any other business, without also talking about technology or vice versa. Um, so, the, we all know that the rapid technological advances uh, being made in all fields of endeavor uh, pres present some really daunting <coughs> challenges, but also some tremendous opportunities for institutions like Web. Um, 
It was actually these realities, the pervasive nature and the speed of tech advances that were the genesis of the new labs and makerspace. Um, the overall objective was to prepare web graduates for what certainly will be a more dynamic, exciting, and challenging high-tech future. But like all great achievements, <coughs> these unique facilities are the, collabor or the result of the collaboration and hard work of many, many people. Um, my own views about the subject were informed by my deep immersion in advanced technology in Silicon Valley for the past 20 years. Um, the emerging technologies being developed there, as you know, um, are truly revolutionary. And I'm talking about you know, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, virtual reality, the cloud, machine learning, autonomous vehicles, drone robotics, on and on, blockchain technologies, uh, and so forth. And we now know <coughs> many applications, even in the marine field, of these disrupted, of these tech ap applications are amazingly disruptive and even game changing in many cases. And they all, all are evolving at light speed. So a couple of years ago, with this knowledge and these insights, several of us got together here on campus to discuss the implications um, of these and related developments. Uh, it didn't take long for us to realize that the IT infrastructure on campus might be insufficient to maintain web's prominence in the fields of data architecture and marine engineering. Um, and in fact, what then existed and was being planned for the time suggested that web was very much in danger of falling short of the facilities, equipment, and systems. Um, then they, they needed to prepare web graduates increasingly uh, uh, for the future. Um, these collective, well, the, the other observation at the time I think was very important was we were by that time recognizing that the future of naval architecture and marine engineering may be as much about silicon and data analytics as it is about steel. <coughs> so those collective uh, epiphanies were, um, were prompted the development of the amazing new computer and innovation lab and makerspace. And think about this, this is, a, this is the IT infrastructure for this institute. And it's, in, you know, it's, it's an innovation space, it's IT, it's an incubator, whatever. Um, but it's to give the <coughs> students a chance to really get dip, deeply immersed in the highest leading edge technologies. Um, so the challenge is that the pace of IT innovation uh, is so remarkable that just staying abreast of what's going on is going to be a continuing challenge for web. Um, but today's milestone is a giant, giant leap forward. So let me conclude by thanking all who have contributed to the progress made to date uh, in the development of these terrific 21st century facilities. I particularly want to acknowledge the Dean's leadership and the work of the dedicated faculty who have been involved in this, uh, for making this a reality today. Uh, so paraphrasing Star Trek's Captain Kirk, <laughs> Uh, I presume that now, with these new facilities, Webb may now go boldly where no one has gone before. <laughs> sponsoring the Zane Lecture Series and endowing the first full tuition scholarship at Webb. Al and Joyce were early donors to the Couch Academic Center by providing a cornerstone level campaign gift, establishing the Alfred and Joyce Zane Academic Wing.
With us today will be uh, Gray Zane, Al and Joyce's son. Al worked at General Dynamics Shipyard in Groton, initially in engineering and the planning departments, and by age 33, <coughs> led its mergers and acquisition initiatives. In 1968, Gillette hired Al to lead its newly acquired Braun division in Germany. Al would spearhead the development of the sensor Razor and go on to serve eight years as Gillette's CEO and chairman of its board. Over my first five years as president of Webb, Peggy and I regularly visited Al and Joyce at their homes in Naples, Florida, and Woods Hole. We developed a strong friendship and looked forward to our time together. I remember asking Al how his education supported his career. Al replied, my MBA from Harvard was very helpful during my years at Gillette. But the knowledge I gained at Webb in so many disciplines, including metallurgy, was instrumental in Gillette hiring me. And then with a sense of pride, he added, Webb made me the person I became. In recent years, Al has had advanced Alzheimer's. When Peggy and I asked Joyce to consider making this gift to support the Couch Academic Center, she immediately agreed. She said, this makes me so happy. I know it is exactly what Al would have done. Joyce passed away in August of 2017. Al passed away 19 months later. We will miss them both. Thank you. Our next space is named the Ruby Lounge, and I'd like to invite um, Gene Schwartz to come up and tell a little reason why the name and, and why he decided to uh, get his friends and family together for this space. Gene? touched to have each of you here with me today as we open the Ruby Lounge. Thank you. There's quite a lot of love here. When I met my wife Ruth in 1946, my sister Ruby became Ruth's little sister. Ruby was my brother Dan's when, in 1978, Ruby was taken from us in a tragic car crash along with her son Michael. Her husband Fred is with us today, together with his lovely wife Barbara. A couple of months ago, Fred and Ruby's son Gary told me he couldn't make it today because he had some kind of litigation problem in California. And I heard last night that Gary's coming. And I saw him for a moment, and I know he's here somewhere. <laughs> he belongs here for this event. Ruby's death had a profound effect upon her twin, Dan, who called me up a few days later, after the accident, actually a couple of weeks later, he said, Gene, I'm going to be a lawyer. He wanted to help people. Dan did just that in Virginia. Dan's dear wife, Ellie, and daughter, Linda, now a Virginia judge, are, are with us today. Ruby was kind and soft-spoken, but tough. She graduated from Antioch, which also had a work program somewhat similar to Will. 
I remember <coughs> relishing helping people in a St. Paul hospital. Ruby got her graduate degree in art from the Philadelphia College of Art, and she was an accomplished artist. I know Ruth and Dan join me in deep gratitude to Keith and Peggy, Peggy and all the Webb family who made this opportunity a reality. When Dan first suggested to me that we might name the Ruby Lounge, we pictured it a place where students would wonder what they might face after graduation. We knew from our experience that unknown challenges await them, and we hope they would seize those opportunities. Thank you. The William H. Webb Gallery, as I mentioned, will be the, the passageway that that was uh, Carol spoke of between Stevens and Taylor Hall and our new academic center. Um, this was sponsored by the class of 1954, and on behalf of that class, Tom Manuel will make some remarks. Tom? items in the history of when moving from the Bronx to Glencoe. Wow, what a move, huh? Yeah, I mean, when you look what's out there and you drive through the Bronx, <laughs> <laughs> Also, more recently, the conversion into a co-ed institution. institution. I think that's fabulous in, uh, to bring in the females and have a mixed crowd, and it's great. Okay. I, we want to extend our thanks uh, to the trustees, to the administration, to the, to the uh, who are those people that teach us what to say? <laughs> <laughs> All of them. And uh, where might we go in another 10 or 15 years? It's really exciting. And I feel very strongly, New York State was mentioned, I feel that Webb really is an educational diamond, one of the best in New York State, and possibly in the U.S. Thank you. The next space we'll hear about is the Caldara and Junio Rotunda. So Don Caldara will say some words on that. Don? Thank you all for coming to this marvelous occasion. Joe has uh, graciously uh, suggested that I speak on our joint behalf, uh, and uh, I was surprised that he didn't speak more about himself uh, when he had the chance to speak of his 
sponsorship of the McAuliffe space. But I think everybody knows that uh, my roommate, my classmate, Joe Cuneo, has been such a wonderful benefactor, trustee, uh, guiding hand at Webb and Snavy and other things that, uh, in, in a sense, other than applause, please, he, know, he knows no, he has no, no, no Today, uh, Shad, talk about your experience at Webb, how you fit in, and how you felt the capital campaign uh, was either timely or with with your own ideas. Uh, Joe and I shared uh, the uh, Northeast New York experience. He uh, grew up in the uh, Pelham Bay section of the Northeast Bronx. I grew up in Westchester and Ossining on the Hudson, about 35 miles from one another. His dad was in real estate, my dad was an electrician. Uh, I go into this kind of stuff, I hope so that everybody thinks about some of the minutia of their own web experience. Uh, I, I will, at the end of my few remarks, speak to a summary of what I think the web experience was for Joe and Don. But in any event, uh, as I say, he went to Bronx Science. I went to a Catholic school in Westchester. Uh, the subject of web came up sort of as an aside. Uh, went into a trig class in my uh, senior year, and was it was announced by the Irish Christian brother who uh, uh, fit the stereotype beautifully. He had his board of education, which, which uh, uh, administered uh, justice to those who weren't prepared, <laughs> but also uh, had, had a ruler on it because it was a mathematics class. <laughs> he, he announced that uh, uh, you and you are going to go take a test on Saturday. And I was one of the yous. <laughs> We both, of course, protested immediately because we were busy. Uh, and he explained that though we were first and second in our class, we weren't going to graduate because we weren't going to pass mathematics. <laughs> that, that was kind of interesting. But he, also, he also explained, this was 1948, uh, uh, 49, uh, he also explained that, well, there's a special place uh, in the New York area it teaches an engineering course built around ships, but it's got a special uh, scholarship, uh, and it would fit you guys addressing the 60 people he was talking to in the class. Uh, it, it focuses on people in need, and uh, it would be a great honor to our school if you, one of you, were able to get into web. Well, uh, naturally, we uh, wanted to graduate, so we took the test. <laughs> and now, picking up a corner from what Joe said, I remember the interview to come into Webb uh, with Admiral Haverly and with Pierce McAuliffe, who uh, took me through the tell us about yourself, tell us about your family, uh, tell us about your school. Uh, tell us about what your interest in engineering is and what your interest in ships were. Well, I could get through three or four of those topics, uh, mentioning that I would applied to other engineering schools, but I said, well, uh, I haven't had too much time to think about ships, but after school, I used to go down to the Hudson and jump into the breakers and admire the Hudson River dayliners uh, as, as they created these wonderful waves. And, uh, the good Admiral and Mr. McCullough uh, took about 30 seconds looking at one another. <laughs> I figured that was the best I could do, and it was total candor. But in any event, uh, uh, it, it pro proved out uh, to be a wonderful opportunity. Joe and I met as roommates, which, which we enjoyed that experience for three years, really. Uh, 
we enjoyed our uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, work term. Again, I, I go into this kind of as reminders to all of us uh, about the things that have touched us because we were Webbies. Uh, Joe and I had great fun uh, when we learned how to weld to welding classmates and turn them into cages. <laughs> uh, we also had reasonably good fun uh, exploring New York City in the evening and Brooklyn Heights and things like that. Uh, the next year we sailed together as the world's coldest and wettest uh, engine cadets on the uh, uh, SS American Lawyer of U.S. lines. Uh, we lived in the little doghouse back aft uh, on the fantail, and uh, because it was winter North Atlantic, the crew was very, very considerate of us. They, 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 they put a, they rigged a, a wire line so that we could at least come up and eat once in a while. <laughs> a, a relatively wet experience, <laughs> and, but we. We both learned something from that uh, shipboard experience. Uh, as many of those in this room have done, we, uh, we learned that we were more interested in ship operation than building ships. Well, uh, time, time moved on. We enjoyed our web experience. Joe graduated number one in our class. I was blessed to be number two and got the, the uh, uh, what you would call it a word. <laughs> <laughs> and and he off, went off to Harvard Business School. I went to Yale Law School. Uh, he had a, a career in building ships, operating ships, LNG ships. You got lovely models here of some of Joe's LNG ships, which uh, run successfully still today. Uh, I, I uh, will summarize a a interesting web career. I worked briefly at a, a law firm, went to work for an international shipping company. Uh, summarizing it uh, all, uh, 11 jobs in 55 years, uh, longest uh, in duration, uh, 14 or 15 years, uh, did ship design, I did port engineering, did regulatory stuff, uh, got into acquiring uh, truck lines for the company uh, in the early days of intermodalism, uh, ran, ran the passenger ships of the company uh, during a time when they were labor intensive and the 707 was beating the hell out of passenger transportation on the high seas. Uh, subsequently, I uh, got sick a little while, got, came back, uh, was, uh, ran, a, ran a ship management company with six, 60 ships that we uh, railroads and tankers and built the two largest ships built in the hemisphere here for Shell. Uh, went on to be executive vice president at the company's biggest, at the country's biggest barge line. Uh, was lured away to be chairman of a cruise company, which we took public. Uh, ended up in Europe, in Geneva, and Russia as the CEO of a Russian joint venture, Swiss Bank joint venture in tourism and cruise ships, uh, and uh, retired, I think, for about the sixth time <laughs> after coming back and being the uh, corporate development guy of, of uh, a southeastern uh, uh, marine company uh, that had tankers and offshore oil vessels and towboats. The common theme of my career uh, like Joe's, was it wasn't traditional naval architecture, but uh, it was marine. It was satisfying, and it really highlighted the things that are best about web. The experience, the intensity of the engineering background, the discipline, and yet the, the basics of making sound decisions and working hard. The summary, I think Joe would agree, web was the defining element of our lives. We've had a successful and wonderful lives, wonderful families, wonderful careers, wonderful industry friends. But web, web, 
web was the defining item that made us what we are today. And I think all of us in our heart of hearts would have to reflect that it's hard to think of anything other than web that has been basic to us. Uh, we are pleased to have our name on the wall in the web rotunda where uh, people entering the new building after this wonderful capital campaign can see Mr. Webb's statue before going to see these wonderful facilities, classrooms, and so forth. It didn't only happen because of Joe and the people in this room. It happened for, because of those over the years who served Webb and served its students and served those in this room so well. The administration, a wonderful faculty, a wonderful staff uh, who, who, who became friends and mentors, wonderful fellow alumni who gave a helping hand to two young non-naval architect workers who were making their way in the shipping business. Uh, but the real, real, real excitement about being part of this capital campaign is to know that we had a small part in perpetuating the wonderful, forward-looking generosity of William H. Webb, who made us all what we are today. Just had our second 
room inspection this morning. <laughs> Yesterday afternoon, my room failed. Now get this, how times have changed. Number one, dusty room. <laughs> Cluttered desks. <laughs> Clothes not hung up, hung up. One t-shirt right now. <laughs> Number four, pillows not beneath my bedspread. <laughs> Number five, desk drawer open one quarter inch. <laughs> Disillusionment, right? <laughs> Today again, my room failed. <laughs> again, desk drawer open a quarter inch. Dusty floor, books on bed. Particularly nasty, because between classes I just have time to throw my books on the bed and grab the new ones. Is that a crime? <laughs> now I don't know if Pete Van Dyke is here. If you are, don't get mad at me. <laughs> Also that uh, he wrote about interesting upperclassmen. <laughs> One excerpt from another day is, I have to study some chem and PNA yet tonight. Same paragraph. There were a lot of characters here. For instance, a senior named Van Dyke walked down the hall to get 200 nickels at 10.30 p.m. wearing sunglasses a straw hat, sport shirt, and Bermudas, at the same time smoking a pipe. <laughs> the guy say he would be ready to village for a while. <laughs> That's where Professor Diamond lives. My, my cow prop lives here. Okay, more disillusionment on this day, early September. My class rank, no privacy then. 24 out of 24. <laughs> he always thought he was failing out, always. After graduation, now I'm going to jump way ahead. Well, graduation was the day after, it was June 28, 1963. We got married June 29, 1963. And for five years, Ron would not return to campus. I'd say, you know, don't you want to go to wed, you know, for some reunion or something? No. <laughs> Fifth anniversary came, he was, we were happy to come and we haven't stopped coming, we haven't come back since, I mean, we haven't stopped coming back since. Moving here now, many years later in the President's role, in the late 90s to 2005, was incredible despite the fact that I said to him for many, many years, I will never live on Long Island. <laughs> he, never, he never said why, but I always knew he wanted to come back here, and I said, no. <laughs> but hosting guests here at the President's House was an honor and exhilarating for us. Taking visitors all over the campus was a really proud time for us to show off this wonderful place. The interaction with the students, the faculty, the staff, and the alumni, all of you, was the highlight of our stay. So many wonderful, hardworking people. Now, just to end this, I have one more thing to say. And I wanted, if any of you want to come over and say hello, um, Ron loved Webb so much. And in his final days, unbeknownst to me, he took his class ring to a local jeweler. And on my birthday, he presented me with a gift. And I, I couldn't believe it. He took his ring, the jeweler took his ring, but it was Ron's design, and I'm wearing it around my neck today. He took the stone, had that put in the middle, the clipper ship on one side, and the web insignia on the other side. And that just shows you, I think, um, his great love to William Webb and all that he did in his vision for Webb Institute. It was, it was just incredible. Now Webb is continuing in the next step into the future. And I'm so proud of you all. It is just absolutely wonderful. Thank you, everyone.
Research Lab, and on behalf of the class of 1968, John O'Day will speak from the back of the auditorium. John? We had our 50th reunion in May of 2018, just last year. Is this working? Yeah. 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 Special credit goes to Dave Beauvais, who organized the gift 
and made solicitation calls to the class. The naming rights to this space were granted based upon the significant financial contribution made by our class to the campaign for web. Beyond funding of the conference room, the class also contributed an additional amount to support one, a one-quarter scholarship for future students uh, in the hope that no qualified applicant be unable to attend web due to financial concerns. When I think about the class of 1970, in my mind's eye, we're not a group of retirees or soon to be who are able to make a significant financial contribution to web. Instead, we're a bunch of 22-year-old guys looking forward to the challenges, opportunities, and delicious possibilities that lay ahead. Fifty years later, in my quiet moments, I look back fondly on the members of the class and what we have accomplished personally and professionally that forms the basis for this dedication. Some gave more, some gave less to the campaign, but the class of 70 had a 100% participation rate, which in my view is the most significant achievement and demonstration of our class's commitment to Webb Institute and the memory of William Webb. During my 30 years in ship management, I found that 5% of our ship's offices would try and avoid cooperating with the new company policy. <laughs> Given that everybody in WEB contributed to the campaign, I am gratified to say there are there were no five percenters in the class of 70. <laughs> having gone, despite having gone our separate ways, the class of 70 conference room is a permanent reminder of the dedication of our dedication to Web Institute and to each other. We have a special debt of gratitude as we were the last class to receive a room and board scholarship, which I hope we've made a payment on. Thank you very much. <laughs> suggested to me a couple of years ago that we should sponsor a conference room. I looked at him with uh, incredulity because um, as having been class agent for over 40 years, I kind of knew what our class was capable of doing. <laughs> I was thinking that was a uh, bridge too far. <laughs> but but uh, he patiently explained to me how we were going to do this. Uh, he and Peggy were going to make a cornerstone contribution. The rest of the class was going to match that. And then Jerry and Marguerite Lenfast was going to match that. And all of a sudden, it went from impossible to possible. And uh, the class came together, um, classmates, and I want to also recognize its classmates, and in many cases, wives of classmates, because these are family gifts. Um, Keith and Peggy were an inspiration to us, and that really, I think, was a strong motivation. We wanted to uh, name it the Keith and Peggy Michelle Room. Uh, but Keith is a very modest person, as those of you know him. Um, and he said, no, um, uh, there would be other ways uh, for the name to be memorialized. So it is the class of 1973. But again, it was possible really based, based upon Keith and Peggy making that first significant contribution and leading the rest of us to reach not just into our wallets, but into our hearts our love for, um, for them and our love for the school uh, to make it happen. So, thanks. Moving back up to the uh, first terrace and uh, opposite side from the uh, this terrace is a LaBerge terrace. And on behalf of the LaBerge family, John LaBerge, say some more. John. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as a web alum, a member of the Board of Trustees, and a member of the Design Committee that uh, you've heard talked about uh, earlier today, 
that has worked on this project for the past five years, I'm very proud to be here today and help dedicate this new facility and begin a new and exciting chapter in the history of Webb. Throughout this process, I have been energized by the effective and steady leadership of Webb's president and my friend, Keith Bichel. We simply would not be here today without his persistence and drive to continuously improve Webb. And I want to take this opportunity to thank him for everything that he does for Webb. Regarding our terrace, my wife Deborah and I uh, are pleased to be supporting Webb with this naming opportunity for what I consider to be a signature feature of the Bentel's uh, amazing 21st century design. We sim you simply can't design, uh, describe this new building without talking about the green rooftop terraces. We are proud to have the LaBerge name associated with one of them. I also want to mention that my wife and I will be underwriting the placement of benches on our terrace in memory of my wife's parents, Hanford and Evelyn Willard, and in honor of my par parents, Jack and Carolyn LaBerge. We hope that by creating a welcoming and serene spot in the center of campus, future generations of Webb students will be able to step away from the rigors and intensity of life at Webb and enjoy some fresh air while taking in the million dollar views of Long Island Sound and those amazing Webb sunsets. As chair of the Finance Committee and the Board of Trustees, I also want to thank everyone in this room and the hundreds of others who could not join us here today for making this project a reality. But we are not done. We will need your continuing support through the various annual funds and through planned giving as members of the Heritage Society to finish paying for this wonderful new facility. More importantly, your continuing support will help to perpetuate the truly unique educational experience that makes Webb such a special place. Thank you all, and I hope you enjoy the rest of today's activities. It's their special name for the upstairs coffee lounge, and I'll let Mark Marchini just explain it. <laughs> now, we've got up to 1979. I feel like the young kid on the block here. <laughs> we go to 42 years ago. Four juniors get uh, two rooms in the West Tower on the second deck. One we turn into a shared bunk room and the other we turn into an event space. <laughs> now what kind of place is this? Now I want you all, now listen to me and go with me on this, close your eyes. We're going to do a little imagination here. We're going to go to a wind-blown desert, like in a John Ford movie. There's an eroded sign hanging from a crooked lamppost, a uh, crooked signpost. Barely visible on that sign are the letters. They say, Squatter's Gulch, population four. <laughs> this is a refuge from a hostile environment. <laughs> On the side of the signpost, there's a bleached skull. There's a knife thrust into the signpost. There's a noose hanging from the sign. What kind of people are within here? A little bit rebellious? Yes, I think so. So in junior year, we put out a binnacle. Uh, apparently it caused an uh, uproar amongst the alumni uh, because of some of the content included within. If uh, later generations unfortunately had to uh, have more approvals of alumni, uh, uh, approvals of the uh, school for your binnacle, we apologize for that. <laughs> the following year, um, in protest uh, of that incident, we decided not to have a binnacle. <laughs> Senior year, Squatters Gulch moved from the West Towers to the apartment above the tank. It had more room, we had more 
people there, more apartments in it. And uh, that was good for us. If we roll forward 40 years till the beginning of this year, as we plan the reunion, we were trying to come up with a way that we could fund one of these uh, naming opportunities. And Steve Bright, uh, one of our team, uh, he had a very good career in the Boston area, not marine, by the way, and he realized he was fortunate in his career and that not everyone uh, could uh, participate equally generously in giving. So he issued a challenge on behalf of uh, the class to say, look guys, I'll put up half, you guys have to do the rest of the work, and we responded to that, and we put together the challenge, and we came up with the funding. So thank you, Steve, for all of that uh, contribution. We talked today about some of the family stories that we share, and uh, I'll just give two to you here today. So in those days, we only had a handful of female students, and they lived on the north side uh, of the tank, in an apartment above the tank. And uh, one of our band, Doug Henn, uh, struck up a relationship with Kathy Callahan from the class of 1980. Uh, they were actually married in 1981 on the campus upstairs in their main room here. And uh, they actually have the longest marriage uh, of Webb alums running today. So Doug and Kathy, hello. <laughs> we also have a bit of a reputation around here for second generations. Now, my son, uh, Nico Martichini, Nico, are you there? Yeah, there you go. Uh, he was a sailing nun in high school. He really dreamed of going into yacht design. He graduated from Webb in 2009, and he had a great career that came afterwards, unfortunately not in yacht design, as often happens in Webb. <laughs> so what do we celebrate today? We celebrate dreams of youth. We celebrate this fellowship of a band of travelers that make their journey through Webb and from there on to life. And we recognize, of course, our need to contribute to sustain that dream for future generations. So the class of 79 gives the coffee bar to Webb. Squatters Gulch moves from the towers to the tank to its permanent home in the Couch Academic Center. It's a place where future travelers can grow their bonds of fellowship. And a reminder that it's okay to have a rebellious spirit to be independent, to push the boundaries, to disrupt the status quo. Because by doing all of these things, you generate creativity, you generate innovation in all that you do, and that is good. Thank you. Who contributed to 
at Eads Garden, as well as the permanently endowed scholarship established in her name. The fund is dedicated to providing room and board scholarships for needy students, an initiative she strongly supported. I would also like to thank the students who have funded and are constructing a gazebo in Peggy's honor adjacent to the student garden. Finally, I would like to thank the students who have carried on the tradition of the Heritage Society Dinner, an event that Peggy initiated and then proudly watched as the students became increasingly involved in the planning, serving, and cooking of the dinner. Today, the students do it alone, and they do it very well indeed. Peggy was a quiet leader who enjoyed helping others excel. If Peggy were here today, she would be humble and a bit overwhelmed by this acknowledgement. Thank you to all of you for recognizing her contributions to what? Thank you. Chairman 
CEO and President of Bollinger Shipyards, Boise presided over an exponential growth of a private, multi-generational family business founded on the banks of the Louisiana Bayou. Started by his father in 1946, Bollinger Shipyards grew into a powerhouse under Boise's direction. From an upstart boatyard, the ability of Bollinger Shipyards to get a U.S. Coast Guard contract was the first sign of how strong a leader they had in Boise. Under Boise's leadership, the company expanded from one shipyard to 12 facilities located in southern Louisiana. It was during this expansion that Bollinger Shipyards made the transition from boat building to ship manufacturing with government, commercial, and private contracts abounding over the course of nearly five decades. Bottom line, Boise was one of the true deans of shipbuilding. In December 2014, Bollinger Shipyards was sold to then Chief Operating Officer Ben Bordelon, who himself just finished a term as a web trustee and the family that owns Edison Chouette Offshore. Boise and his wife Joy are tremendously passionate philanthropists and give back to a myriad of local and national organizations, including the U.S. Coast Guard Foundation, the National World War II Museum, the National Ocean Industries Association, the Boy Scouts of America, the Shipbuilders Council of America, and of course, Web Institute. Boise has received numerous awards, including a designation of Louisiana Legend by Louisiana Public Broadcasting, the Distinguished Service Award from the Boy Scouts of America, the Woodrow Wilson Award, and the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers, Vice Admiral Henry S. Land Medal for Outstanding Accomplishment in the Marine Field. Boise served as a member of our Board of Trustees from 2006 until 2015. He feels his strongest contribution to the Web Board was encouraging an improved focus on leadership training and is gratified by the continuous efforts in that area. During the commencement, cer commencement ceremony on June 18, 2016, Web confirmed upon Boise the degree of honorary doctor of science. As part of his address, he told graduates that whatever career path you think you have in your head now is not where you're going to end up because the world is not that clear of a blueprint and your life is not as perfect as the science you have learned over the past four years. We are extremely grateful to Boise and Joy for their leadership level commitment to the campaign, campaign for web and establishing the Boise Bollinger Court Guard. Our final space that we'll be discussing today is named for the Jack B. Hadler faculty conference room. So it's, it's named after one of the legends of web and one of the special people of the web family and it was sponsored by another very special member of the web family, Joseph Mazurik. And on behalf of Joe Mazurik, uh, Keith Michelle will say a few things. Keith. Thank you, Matt. The uh, Jack B. Hadler Faculty Conference Room was sponsored by his good friend and mentee, uh, Joseph Masaryk. Uh, Jack, as we all know, graduated from the Naval Academy. He went on a wonderful career at uh, David Taylor Model Base, and he did groundbreaking work in all kinds of propeller design, uh, super cavitating. Ventilating propellers, contour rotating propellers, uh, highly skewed, ducted, partially submerged propellers. He was uh, truly the god of propellers. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of that career, in, in 1978, at the age of 60, when he retired, he came to WIP. And uh, he came as a research, uh, head of the research lab, but uh, two years later we had a need and he taught a class, and then he taught more and more classes. And over the next, uh, oh, 31 years, I think, he taught classes at Webb. He uh, 
He didn't retire until age 93, and uh, at that time I had the pleasure of giving his retirement speech, and uh, his four kids were there, and uh, at least one of them is here today, along with a nephew, yeah, there, and a nephew and others. Uh, I mean a grandson, but uh, uh, Jack, uh, you know, the four, uh, his four children said they, they were thrilled because uh, they never thought their dad would retire before they did. <laughs> <laughs> but at age 93, uh, Jack was just stopping teaching. He stayed at Webb for, until he was age 99. He, uh, he continued to uh, run the model base and, and uh, mentor students in thesis. And, uh, he, he was amazing. Uh, each weekend, he'd drive back to Maryland to uh, see his wife, Carol, and, and uh, return to Webb on Monday for his work. Uh, he was extraordinary, and uh, the students loved him. He, he was a great person to have on campus. He always had an effusive smile, he had boundless energy. He was a man of many talents. If you go up into the Rosenblatt Gallery, you see these beautiful wooden bowls that he turned. Uh, segmented bowls. In fact, uh, in his, the last year of his life, he, uh, each week he would give Peggy and I a, a wood turning lessons, and he really enjoyed that. And then we'd take Jack out to dinner, that was part of the deal. And, <laughs> and, and we'd enjoy the conversation as well. He, he was just an amazing person and an inspiration to all of us here at Webb. Uh, Joe Masaryk himself. Uh, as Matt said, is a legend in his own right. He served as a lab tech here for many years, and uh, he's done some extraordinary things for Webb, uh, many special gifts, and I think this one is one that Joe is very fond of because he had the highest regard for Jack and, and the help that he gave, that Jack gave uh, Joe while he was here at Webb. Thank you. get-together in the Couch Academic Center on the first floor. There'll be a, a gathering at 4.30 on the Burge Terrace, and then 4.45 at Peggy's Garden on the first terrace. Um, the building will be open and available for walkthroughs. If you haven't had the opportunity, please do. Um, I think you'll be very impressed and amazed. Um, and uh, after, again, just following up, after those events, we will begin with the unveiling of the statue of William H. Webb, followed by the <coughs> cutting, and ultimately the reception and out to dinner. So I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to all our speakers and thank you for all of you being a wonderful audience and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and thank you for spending your time. Yeah, Billy was renowned. I just gotta go check something.